Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Tom. Welcome to another study in the Word. I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm going to talk to you today about something that I learned many years ago called living to give. Actually, I was listening to a wonderful preacher. I call him the Prince of, Pe of Preachers. His name was Dr. Jerry Savell, and uh, I actually wrote, read this also in a book that he wrote <clears throat> and caught a hold of it very early in life, and I'm so glad I did, and I'd like to share, share it with you today. Um, what I learned, and I'd like to start off today in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and I'll read this to you out of the Amplified Bible because it does what it says and it amplifies it. So I thought this is nice this way, and I'll read it to you. Acts chapter 20, and let's look down here at verse, uh, let's see here, let's see, did I get this right? Verse 35, I think. Make sure i got to go one more page. There we are. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In everything I have pointed out to you by example, that by working diligently in the, this manner, we ought to assist the weak, being mindful of the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed, makes one happier, and more to be envied to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with receiving. We need to know how to do that also. But, you know, to me, over the years, my experience is that it brings me more joy to be able to give. I don't know about how you feel about that. But to me, giving, I would love to be able to give more and more and more. And so uh, uh, that's a true statement that Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than to receive, though we have to receive to be able to give. Uh we have implemented this. I'm talking about me and my wife. We implemented this as a lifestyle many years ago. And you have to understand that you can't do everything. Now, you know, on Facebook, I've got people every day. You know, it's really difficult even to add anybody to our Facebook page from overseas. Uh, many of them are just after money. I know it sounds terrible to say that, but, you know, you can't help everybody. But you can do what you can do, and, and you can do what the God leads you to. So we all need to take, make that uh, make that decision. Make your lifestyle a lifestyle of giving. Uh, now, learning about the this, uh, let's just start with the power of tithes and offerings. I want to talk about that for a second from a little bit different perspective than maybe you've heard it taught before. But let's, let's go over to Malachi chapter three. Malachi chapter three. And uh, for some reason, many uh, Christians today have kind of felt like, you know, the tenth was under the law, that uh, they say, well, it's under the law, we don't need to do that anymore, and they kind of blow off the whole tithing thing, but tithing wasn't under the law, tithing was initiated before the law, then it was initiated under the law, and it's initiated uh, today. Uh, just read Hebrews chapter 7, that's all you have to do carefully, and you'll see that Jesus is uh, the high priest who receives tithes today. Malachi chapter 3, though, brings out some things that I think are important. I'm going to read this to you here uh, out of the Amplified Bible. And I'm going to uh, 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 make some comments, but let's start at verse 7. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? So God gives them a little exhortation that they've turned away, and then he answers a question that they're going to have uh, because they're going to ask, well, how did we turn away? And he's going to tell them, verse 8, Will a man rob or defraud God? Yet you rob and defraud me. But you say, in what way do we rob or defraud you? You have withheld your tithes and offerings. I want you to notice there's two things, tithe and offering. Verse 9, you are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, even this whole nation. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 10, bring all the tithe, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven for you, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer, insects and plagues, for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine drop its fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you happy and blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Now, the King James Version here in verse 11 says, And I will rebuke the devourer for you. 
You see, this is a very interesting scripture because, first of all, he points out there's tithes and offerings. 10% is the tithe. Anything over 10% would be an offering. And he points, out, he points this out to this uh, Jewish nation here that was an agricultural nation. And he says that if you bring all the tithe, and their tithe back then would have been things like produce or, you know, uh, cattle or whatever, you know, but mostly they were an agricultural nation. They didn't trade with money like we do today. And so he said to them that if you will return to me and bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there'll be meat in my house, uh, he says, I'll do something for you. I'll open the windows of heaven. And he says, I'll pour you out a blessing. There should not be room enough to receive it. Now, they relied totally, completely. Their whole economy relied upon rain. Uh, it, it wasn't a, uh, a, a society where they irrigated. They didn't have sometimes the ability to irrigate where they were at. So it had to rain. And if it didn't rain, then it affected their entire economy. I mean, it's kind of like that up here in Wisconsin. We don't have much irrigation. They do in California. They do other places. But in Wisconsin, we, we, we rely upon those Midwest thunderstorms to come through and supply the rain for the crops and stuff. And if it doesn't rain, you can get in bad shape. And, uh, but for them, if it didn't rain, they didn't have any water. Their cattle didn't have any water. They didn't have any water for their produce and so on and so forth. And literally, it affected everything about them and everything about their economy. Their economy could literally crash if there was no water. So God says, if you continue to honor me with the first fruits, with the with the tithe, with the first uh, 10% off of this thing, I'll open up unto you the windows of heaven. And I'll continue to make that rain come down, and you'll be blessed, and your crops will prosper, and your cattle will prosper, and so on. That's very interesting. Secondarily, he says, and offerings. And so offerings we'll talk about in a minute. But the tithe is very important. Now, he also says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Now, that was a, a, a where God would get involved in rebuking like the locust and the insects and stuff that would try to eat the crops so that their crops would be insect-free, so to speak, and uh, they can get the biggest harvest possible. So now you can kind of see. Now, you take this into the New Testament, and when he says, I'll uh, open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there should not be room enough to receive it. We need to understand that he's also talking about spiritual rain, and he's talking about it coming down now spiritually on us so that we can begin to prosper in every way because we prosper in the kingdom of God as we prosper spiritually. It says in 3 John 2, as an example, he says, I, I, Brother, and I pray above all things that thou prosper and be in health even as I so prospers. You know, I have a, a friend whose wife uh, got deadly cancer. It wasn't a good report. They went to the doctor and uh, the doctor said, you have this uh, form of cancer and it's in a bad stage. Well, she went to the Lord and she just claimed the scripture there. She says, Lord, we've been tithers all of our lives. And she says, I believe we have tithing rights. You said you would rebuke the devourer for, uh, for us and cancer is a devourer. And, and she says, I'm claiming that scripture. And in a few weeks, she was totally cancer free and has been cancer free now for many, many years. There's power in this that we sometimes uh, don't take advantage of, but it's interesting. So we see the tithe and the rain falling from the tithe. Now, I want you to go also, uh, because we want to see this here and uh, kind of uh, uh, set this all up for you and make this, uh, get the, uh, make this all something that's, uh, that you can understand very simply. If you go to uh, Genesis, and all major, all major Bible doctrines start in Genesis, but if you go to Genesis chapter 8, you'll see here, I think it's yeah, chapter 8, and if you look down at verse 22, let me get over here. All major Bible doctrines start in Genesis. Everything is in there. It's really an interesting book to read because you see the beginning of all things, including uh, everything God did. But it's interesting here, if you look down at verse 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. By the way, I don't want to get off the point too much, but did you notice he said, we're going to have summer, we're going to have winter, we're going to have these seasons, so I wouldn't be too concerned about what they're talking about in, in uh, 
global warming. Uh, the truth of the matter is, in the 1970s, they were saying by the 19 by the time we we are now, uh, the same people that are saying uh, we're we're globally going to get so warm that everything, uh, you know, all the water comes up and dis great disasters and all this, said at that time the same people were saying that you know by this time we'd be in a ice age, and we're not in an ice age. It's actually heated up. So uh, anyway. Just a side note, but if you look down here, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, that's a law. You know, if you go out and you plant corn seeds, you're going to get a harvest of corn. You don't plant corn seeds and get watermelons. You don't plant watermelon seeds and get corn. You know, you, the seed produces after itself. That's a law. And it doesn't make any difference what area you're operating in. It's still a spiritual law. Now, this this uh, people in the Old Testament they operated on a economy of you know this um, you know of of uh, uh, what we would call you know farming and so on and so forth, which is is awesome, and that's what they did back then. Many many cultures still do today. But in our economy in America and around most of the world now, we have something called money, finances. And so the same thing is true, as as, as the Lord points out to us very strongly in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, if you've got an Amplified Bible, I'd like you to read it out of the Amplified Bible. But let's go to 2 Chronicle, or 2 Corinthians, excuse me. Boy, I've been doing too much teaching. I'm getting everything all muddled here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now I'm going to read this to you out of the Amplified Bible. Paul was receiving offerings. They were receiving offerings at the Corinthian church to help some other people, uh, Christians out. And uh, this is what he says about this, starting at verse 6. Remember this, talking about money now. These in, in The Corinthians were, uh, had a different culture. They operated with money, what we would talk about money. Okay, like coins, and they had a, a trade that way. And so he says, remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly, and he who sows generously that blessings may come to someone, he will also reap generously and with blessings. So he's talking about the seed of their giving finances as a seed. Same thing there, spiritual law, giving finances as a seed. So we can see this. And so he says, verse 7, now notice this, Let each one give as he's made up in his own mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or to do without, a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. Look at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace, every favor, and earthly blessing come to you in abundance, so that you may always and under all circumstances, and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. As it is written, he, the benevolent pe person, scatters abroad, he gives to the poor his deeds of justice and goodness and kindness, and benevolence will go on forever. And God, who provides seed for the sower and bread for your eating, will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. Okay. So we can see here he's talking about sowing seeds. Now, this was not tithes. This was a special offering. So you have tithes, which is 10%, which really belongs to God. But we get to we get to choose what we do with offerings. Now, here's what I wanted to say about that. If you think about it, now in the Old Testament, they had tithe, which kept the windows open and the rain coming down. But you can rain as much as you want it to rain. If you don't have any seed in the ground, you're not going to get any kind of crop or harvest. So God here says that as every man makes up in his heart, let him know that he can sow, and whatever he sows, he's going to reap. Now, if you sow little, you'll reap little, but if you sow much, you're going to reap much. My wife and I begin to see this. We begin to see this. Now, this works in every area of life. We're not just talking about finances, but in every area of life. But here, in context, he's really talking about finances. And so, remember, if you sow sparingly and grudgingly, uh, you'll reap sparingly and grudgingly. But if you sow generously, that blessings may come to somebody, you'll reap with blessings. And let each one give as he's made up in his mind, his own heart, purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, now notice this, God loves 
Interesting. God loves, takes pleasure in. I want you to see this because there's a promise here that sometimes we, we, we actually kind of go over, and it's important to get a hold of it. God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt-to-do-it giver whose heart is in his giving. So the first thing we see here is when somebody's like this, and you live a lifestyle of living to give, you begin to see that God is unwilling to do without you. I believe that that can get over in all areas, including your health. I mean, if you're a big giver, if you're, you have a lifestyle of living to give, I believe it can extend your life. At least it says that way here. God's unwilling to do without you. I mean, he's going to keep you around for a long, long time because he can use you. Now, the statistics say that less than, you know, like 4% of Christians give tithes and offerings. That's just, to me, I just, we have 90, we have almost 100% in our church, so, and always have in our churches. I don't understand that, that statistic, but that's what they say. I think it's probably more like 10%, at least I hope it's at least 20% of the people. But here you see that 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 there are promises relating to this, that God loves this, and he's unwilling to do without, you know, a joyous prompt to do a giver whose heart is in his giving. Powerful. Now look down here and, and notice this, though. He also says in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing, come to you in abundance, so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Wow. Absolutely amazing. So... How we prosper in the future has nothing to do with uh, uh, what our background is, where we might be financially, the country we live in. It's up to us. If we will begin to sow, we'll begin to tithe and sow our giving and do it in a way that we do it purposely in the right attitude of our heart and so on and sow it into good, good ground, uh, all things being equal, we're going we're gonna to reap a harvest. Well, my wife and I got a hold of this. We got a hold of this. You know, it says in Luke chapter 6, 38, you know, I mean, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all is righteous. All these things shall be added unto you. See, we're supposed to be seeking first the kingdom of God. Our thinking should be kingdom thinking. This is kingdom thinking. And so it's important. And uh, uh, we begin to see this. We begin to see this right off. Now, when I started, I have to tell you, when we started this, uh, when I married my wife, Stella, we were young. I was 24. She was 22. And I had a little little apartment in Pomona, California. And I had a roommate. It was a small apartment. And uh, the apartment was full of co cockroaches. If you would open up the uh, door, you know, the, the uh, cabinet doors in the kitchen, cockroaches would fall out. So you could get cockroach stew pretty easily. You had to watch it. And uh, that's kind of nasty, but I know, but that's where we started. Well, when I brought her home from my, she didn't know anything about that. She had never been to my apartment. Um, <laughs> and so when we married and I brought her home, she, uh, she got welcomed by cockroaches. She got welcomed by a little bed that laid on the ground, a little mattress. It's not even a bed, half a little uh, mattress that laid on the ground. That's how we started. And I didn't make much money and we were in poverty. And we, we, when we got a hold of this tithing message, you have to understand this. Our finances were here. Okay, and our bills were here. And I couldn't pay the bills every month. It was impossible. So I kind of had to scatter them around and try to keep, you know how the bills change color? You know, and try to keep them. You know, I would pay one, and then uh, I would it, it would be overdue, and I'd try to get the next one before that would be the final bill, and they would turn off my heat or my water or something like that. And that's where we were at. And when I saw this uh, truth about tithing and offering, I, you know, the thing, first thing that hit my mind is, is this impossible to do that? How in the world can I possibly do that? I mean, we don't have enough money to pay our bills. So if I give 10% or some offerings, that means that we're going to even be further down. And, you know, I was thinking totally in the natural. But then I began to get a hold of myself and realize, hey, you know what? Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. God said to prove him in this. Prove me now with, saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. The Lord that has angels out there to help us, praise God, and go go get the money for us. And so I begin to see all of that. 
And so we said, well, you know, it can't really get any worse than it is now. I'm just going to step up by faith and start tithing. And we did. And you know, over a period of a few months, things began to change. We weren't making any more money, but things just seemed to stretch longer. Our food went further. Somebody brought us clothes. Things would happen. And it seemed like all of a sudden now, even though we didn't have any more money, with a 90% the tithe and then giving offerings, our money went a lot longer. It was supernatural. And it got so good that finally I started to make a little bit more money. I got more hours and some things happened like that to where we took a step of faith and we moved from that little tiny apartment over to a beautiful apartment in La Habra, California, Orange County, which was so much better than where we lived before. I mean, it was beautiful. It had a nice pool, nice, beautiful apartment, nice pool, uh, weight room, the whole bit. We were young, and I and I liked all that. And we and we and we there we were. We were on our adventure of faith. And my wife and I, way back then, began to learn to walk by faith, uh, not by sight, in all areas of our life, but especially this area of finances. Well, God blessed us. And, and, and we started uh, uh, increasing. One day I was at work, and my bosses uh, had a, um, I don't know, I guess you could say it this way. Their policy was not to pay anybody more than $7.50 an hour. And I was making that. But, you know, I believe in a good work ethic. I believe the Word of God says we should be the best workers uh, at the job. And uh, we do all things as unto him. And I was implementing that. So I was literally doing uh, probably two or three people's jobs. And my bosses knew it. You see, my bosses, though, had this rule. They couldn't pay, They would not pay anybody any more money. But you see, that doesn't mean God doesn't have a way. One day, and I didn't know anything about it, my bosses found out that uh, uh, a certain organization in the produce, which is a, a very big organization, was looking for somebody who could come and straighten out a bunch of messes that they were having at uh, uh, their dock, run their dock, and uh, that, that this particular individual would be the first person who would supervise the dock that was not a union person. So they, would, they were going to place a union guy with management. If anybody knows what that's like, that's a difficult situation. But uh, my bosses saw this, and they called them down there. They knew these guys. And they said, listen, we got this guy down here, and uh, we think he would be a fan. He's a fantastic worker, and they just bragged on me, bragged on me. So these guys came down there, you know, and found out who I was. They flew all the way down. They flew. They flew down to where we were, and they came in the office, and they called me up there. I didn't even know about this. And I went up, and they kind of interviewed me, and I shook hands with them and everything. And they said, this guy would be perfect. They actually hired me without even talking about it much. And they, I said, we'll take the job. This, I went from making uh, poverty level wages at that particular time, uh, at that particular time, to above average wage in America, just like that, overnight. We moved up there, they paid for the move, and we started our life. See, that's how God blesses you. Sometimes you don't even know how it's going to come, but God began to prosper us. Well, we went through life, and God began to increase us that way. Then we were down in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, we were living there, and I was refinishing bathtubs and tile, and then we moved. Uh, we did some other things, and I began to work at um, a place uh, where uh, where they were. It was what you call uh, phone sales, and I was good at it. And I was making. This is 1990. I began to make about a thousand dollars a week, or more, every single week in phone sales. And but the economy was real bad there, so I would make this money, and then a, the the company I was working for would go under. So I'd go to another company, made the same kind of money, and then I did it about two or three times. Finally, they kept going under because of the economy was so bad there. But I always had a job, you know, I would just get another sales job. I was making a lot of money, had money in the bank, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I haven't seen my my uh, family for ten years. Now I was very frustrated, or four years, excuse me. I was very frustrated at this time because I was waiting to get into ministry, and I was chomping at the bit to get into ministry. Well, this is how God works sometimes, and so. We hadn't seen my family for four years, so we put all of our stuff in storage, and we moved to Reno, Nevada. Now, the rest is history. While we were in Reno, Nevada, of course, God told me to start my first church. And now, I'm telling you all this to say this. We were givers, we were tithers, and we were giving and giving and giving, and God was increasing us. But nothing nothing could be better than getting going from secular work into ministry. That was the greatest blessing ever. And so God says, okay, I want you to go into ministry. We started our first church in our apartment, and we had 15 people in the church. Now, listen. 
God said when I had 15 people in my church, the very first thing he said to me is, I want you to take a salary, a housing allowance. Uh, and I, 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 was making a th I went from making $1,000 a week to $250 a week. And my wife went and got a side job, but we began to preach the word. It began to increase, and pretty soon we had a more increase, and we got a building. Next thing I knew, we could take more money, and God blessed us financially. We The church grew. We got a television ministry that was in California all over, about 30 million homes. Uh, and, and, and things just prospered and prospered and prospered. And so, praise God, we had many miracles financially because we were givers and we were sowers even through the church. Now listen, one time the Lord told me to go on, we were still a fairly small church, and he, <coughs> excuse me, he said to me, go on television. I want you to do uh, your television programs in a studio. And I want you to put them on Fox, uh, Fox Channel Fox and, and others that uh, you can buy time from, that allow you to buy time. And we're talking about airtime on major TV stations. And I didn't have any idea about television. I did not know how expensive it was. And I found out. And I mean, it was way beyond... I mean, we weren't there. We weren't nearly there. We're, there's no way we can put that in our budget, but God said do it. So I went to pray, and I prayed in tongues for about seven, uh, three months, seven hours a day, every day, you know, and, and I told our board we were going to do this and stuff, and they just all kind of nodded at me, and they didn't know what to say, but uh, because when we found out, it was literally impossible to do. There, there was no possible way that in, the, in where we were at, we could ever afford anything like that, even in our budget, even though we were growing. There's just no way. It would have took us many years to get to that place, uh, as far as what our growth was going to be doing and so on. But the Lord said to do it. So uh, one day, you know, we were we were receiving, uh, we were, had a special speaker. And after the, uh, the, the service, I was standing up there. The Lord had told me something special was going to happen today. And I was standing up there, you know, talking to the special speaker. And, and people were milling around after the service and, and waiting for something real special to happen. Because I knew he told me that. And all of a sudden, my guy who's counting the money, you know, our deacon who counted the money, he came out of there. He's all, all turned red. He's red as my shirt, you know. And he just, was, he couldn't hardly talk. Well, what had happened is, uh, is, uh, is enough money had come in in one offering for us to pay for all of the taping. We rented a studio, pay for all of the taping, and pay for all of the airtime for a year in advance. Now, that doesn't happen unless you're sewing. Okay, miracles like that normally don't happen unless you're sowing, unless you're tithing. But we had put ourselves in a position over the years, from the very beginning until that time, to reap those kind of benefits supernatural. That was like a that was like a hundredfold return. I mean, it was amazing, uh, uh, amazing thing that began to happen. Well, we continued to do that, and we continued to have financial miracle after financial miracle. You see, when you live by faith like we do, every week. Literally, we have to believe God for the finances or we're history. I mean, it's been like that for years, but that's the only way to live. And so when the Lord finally told me to leave that church there, put it in somebody else's hands and come up to Door County, Wisconsin up here and start another church. Now I'm thinking I had no support. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't do it that way. I just did it by faith. And I thought, well, I'm going to go up there. I'm 40 years old. I'm going to have to go back to work, which I don't mind. I don't mind working a secular job if I have to. And uh, uh, I'm thinking, you know, whatever God wants to do. Well, we got up there. We started this church with just a few people. But I'm telling you right now, folks, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars begin to come in. And I never did have to uh, take a secular job. In fact, we took a raise. And we've been going ever since. And that, it just didn't make any sense in the natural. It was impossible in the natural. But you see, we had, we had, we had prepared a good preparation for the day ahead by learning about tithes and offerings. Now today I'm 60 years old. We're sitting here and God is still doing miracles financially, miracle after miracle after miracle. We have to live that way. And he's expanding our ministry. And so every day I get up, we need more money. And so I'm having to believe God and people are partnering with us and, and God is raising up an army to stand with us to get this stuff done. But you know, we have adopted this uh, lifestyle of giving. Now you can adopt the same thing. And I would encourage you to do so. In fact, before I get you off, I'll just say this to you. You know, many people, you always need to be supporting the people that feed you. 
I really believe that. That would be, of course, the tithes should go to your local church. I don't ever want your tithes unless you just don't have somewhere else to go. But I'll tell you this. Sometimes people take advantage of things like YouTube videos and TV and all the things we're on Periscope, and they watch it every day. And really, that is one of the major sources of their spiritual food. And yet they never give. They never sow. And you know what? We need to understand there's a principle there. If you're getting fed by somebody's teaching spiritually, shouldn't you minister to them financially? The answer to that is yes, and that's biblical. So I would encourage you to do so. We're looking for partners out there. And, you know, we want people to pray for us. I'm unashamed about this. We need your help financially if you, uh, if you would be able to help us because we're trying to expand into all these kind of different places. And we're doing well, but we need more help. And so God is recruiting, if I could use that term, partners to stand with us. And so adopt a lifestyle of giving and you'll be blessed. You'll see things and miracles that other people won't see. We love you. We're praying for you. You can go to our website, faithalivefellowship.org. That's faithalivefellowship.org. Over there, we have free seminars. You can hop on our other YouTube page. Uh, all of our seminars on there are free. We don't charge anything. And there's a lot of teaching. And you can find out where we're going to be preaching and information about us if you have any questions. And you can also give there. There's PayPal, and you can give, or you can uh, find out how to send checks and all that kind of stuff. But we really love you guys. We're praying for you every day. I hope these teachings are val valuable. And if this has blessed you today, please take it and post it and give it to other people. Post it on your Facebook and other things. We appreciate that. Until next time. This is Tom. God bless you. We love you. Be blessed.